Here we are. All right. Well, welcome everyone to our June Wheel Talk. It is, as always, a pleasure to see your faces, to have you um, joining us in this um, space of sharing, of exchanging, of going into deeper discussions on specific topics. And obviously, everybody's welcome. Um, but I want to give a very special welcome to our speaker this month for her generosity and for everything that she's going to bring to us today, Hannah Temple. She is the founder of Teal Co, and, um, a regenerative consultancy supporting pioneering organizations on the route to regenerative. <coughs> Hannah previously spent many years as a human rights and sustainability specialist, working with some of the world's largest organizations. Tilko's um, work is shaped by many influences, including permaculture, systems thinking, donut economics, economics circular economy, bio, bio me, 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 oh my God, Hannah, you gotta help me with that word. And <laughs> Three by Liddy. Oh my gosh, those words are tough. For a Spanish person, I'm from Spain, by the way. My name is Anna. I am the network co lead for WEAL, for the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. I'm sharing this um, network co lead role with my colleague here, Tovile Titenden. Um, she's based in uh, South Africa, <laughs> I'm based in Spain, and it's our pleasure to welcome you all today. Um, to this real talk. So you want to be regenerative, um, exploring what it means to be a regenerative organization in practice. So for those who are joining this real talk for the very first time, real talks is a participatory event. So we have the pleasure to have Hannah here, but then once she has finished her presentation is about all of us um, asking questions, but sharing our own experiences or our own examples. And um, we're gonna be all the time together in this conversation. And I hope that you enjoy, but you participate as well and you make your voice heard um, through the conversation. And especially as I always say, there is no better way to learn than actually having fun. Um, I'm positive we're going to have fun with what we are going to be exploring today. So thank you so much for joining us. And Hannah, the mic is yours. Oh, and by the way, if you want to leave any comments or if you want to leave any questions while Hannah is doing her presentation, do it and I'll take care of that once she has finished. Amazing. Thank you so much, Anna, for the wonderful <coughs> introduction. And so great to see all of these faces interested in this topic. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to share my screen and take us through a bit of a presentation. So hopefully you can see. Is that working OK? Can I get, what did you call this, Tobile? Yes. You had a name for this, Tobile, this signal. A shop shop. <laughs> shop, shop. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so I actually, on the spirit of what Anna was just saying about this being an interactive conversation, I would love to just start with a quick couple of questions to you all. So I'd love, first of all, just to say, if you were gonna score yourself and say, how familiar are you with this concept a regenerative organization? Where would you put yourself? If one is, it's all new to me, I've not really heard of this before, and five is, oh yeah, this is kind of territory that I'm, I'm kind of in quite a lot. I'm really familiar with this idea. Um, maybe you could just quickly put in the chat, just a quick, a quick score of, of where you put yourself on that spectrum. So I can see some twos and threes, bring that over here, one, threes, this is great because I think it's really, really useful to see that, you know, we're all learning here. Um, and to Anna's point that when we come to, I'm going to be kind of speaking for the first sort of half an hour or so, but then it's really great to spend the second half of this conversation in dialogue with one another because there will be so much wisdom in this group um, outside of what I'm hoping to offer. So really an encouragement. There are no silly questions. Whatever you want to ask, ask it because I'm sure someone is, is thinking the same. And I have a second question, which is just, you know, does anyone in the group, are you working already on something related to this idea of regenerative organization, regenerative practice? 
maybe with a client or in your own organization or in your own life, if there is something that you're working on that you'd like to share or make us aware of, then please do pop that in the chat. And then, you know, it would be great to circle back to those uh, in the discussion just to see if we can learn a bit more about what you're up to. Okay, so I think it's really important for us to start this conversation with just a couple of minutes about what do we mean by this word regenerative. Um, we probably all have some good ideas about this, but I think it's really helpful to get an understanding of how I understand this word and how I'm going to be using it in this initial part of our discussion. So I think the most simple and straightforward definition of what it means to be regenerative is it something that's regenerative is something that is creating conditions for the greater thriving of life. And when we talk about life, that's a really holistic term. That's people, that's communities, that's ecosystems, that's all of the organizations and soil and components that make up life on this planet. So it's a really, really holistic concept. It's also implicit in this definition is an emphasis on improvement, on restoration, on making things better, that emphasis on greater thriving. So it's really a, a kind of a transformatory piece. It's really about making things better than the way they are now. And thirdly, there's this element of thriving. It's not just about creating conditions for life to survive. It's really about saying, well, we want to aim for something more ambitious. We want to aim for flourishing of all of the people, communities, ecosystems on the planet. So it's a holistic concept. It's an ambitious concept. And it's really about transformation. So it's quite radical in many ways. Now, lots of people will ask, you know, well, how does this compare to sustainability? I thought that's, you know, what sustainability was about. How do these things fit together? So I just want to encourage us to have a quick look at the definition of sustainability. So a definition of sustainability is something that can be sustained indefinitely within planetary and human boundaries. And that's absolutely what we want to be aiming for. That is a, a wonderful ambition. That sweet spot is where we want to be. But the problem that we face is that many of the ecological and social systems that we inhabit are already really degraded and damaged, whether we're thinking about inequality, poverty, mental health or climate change, biodiversity, soil loss, ocean acidification, you name it. Our systems are already in a really perilous state. So I would argue that in order for any organization or system to be sustainable, it first of all needs to be regenerative. It needs to restore and improve the situations to reach a point where we can talk about maintaining those systems indefinitely. So this term, this idea of regenerative, this holistic idea that actually in the kind of breadth of it, brings together a whole host of schools of thought and disciplines from all sorts of different areas, circular economics, brings together human rights, uh, regenerative leadership, built environment work. There's a whole host of different ideas that I think fall under this umbrella of regenerative. So this is a big concept. But I think if we think about the scale of the challenges that we face, then it's entirely appropriate that where we look for answers is something that's equally big and encompassing. So how do we apply to organisations in practice? What does this really mean within an organisation? And how on earth are we going to cover something so comprehensive in 25 minutes or try to? Um, well, at Tealco, what we'd find really helpful is to consider examples from nature, to think about what nature can teach us about what it means to be regenerative, because that is what nature does. Nature is the expert and teacher on supporting the greater thriving of life. So in the course of this discussion, we're going to be encouraging us to think about organizations, maybe from a slightly different angle, and think about them as living systems, as organisms. And to support us to do that, and to help us get our heads around the kind of size of this question, we're going to be using a metaphor of a tree and thinking about the different elements and how that relates to the different areas of activity, operation, structure that make up an organization and how it behaves. So I'm just going to talk us through this metaphor first of all so that you know what I'm going on about and then we'll go in more detail into the components of it. 
So one aspect of a tree and how it's made up and how it survives is, of course, the soil. And in the metaphor, this relates to an organization's grounding, the foundations from which it emerges. So that includes things like its origin story, but also kind of its, its ownership and its financing structures. Then we come to the roots of the organization. This, in the metaphor for us, represents the network of the organization, the people within it, with whom it relates and interacts. The third element is the trunk. This is a big area and includes loads of internal features of what it's like to actually be in that organization. What holds it together? How does it actually work internally? Fourthly, fruits, flowers, foliage. What does the organization put out into the world? It's products, but also things like waste and so on. And then finally, the fifth area is materials. What are the materials that flow through the organization? In a tree, we're talking about water and nutrients and energy. What are the comparable things for an organization? And how might each of these different five groupings of kind of elements of an organization how might we think of them in terms of this question of what it means for them to be more regenerative, more supportive of the greater thriving of life? So we're going to go deep into each of these five. And as I say, there's a lot to cover here. So hold on to your seats. It's going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour. We're going to start as we must with the story. So as I mentioned, this is about the organization's grounding, the place from which it came. Um, so that includes, yes, its origin story, how and why it came into being. What's the vision and mission that shapes what the organization does and who it is? What are the ownership and financing structures upon which it was based and developed? And what is its relationship, intrinsic relationship with the natural world? This is, as I say, not an exhaustive list, but some examples of the kinds of things that I include within this area. Now, how does this, how do these features relate to this question of how an organization might be more regenerative or less regenerative? If we take vision as an example, if an organization has a vision which is quite uh, internally focused and maybe has kind of an either implicit or explicit focus on, on profit being the main driver. Um, for example, we want to be the best producer of chocolate bars or we want to be the biggest provider of flower pots in the world or something like that. That's not intrinsically degenerative, but if you have a vision that is built into it, there is a reference to a more systemic problem for society, for people, for the planet, that the organization is there to serve, then that I think gives the organization much more freedom, much more permission to make choices, to make decisions that are more supportive of the greater thriving of life. So really what we're talking about, we're talking about soil and the grounding, is what are the kind of foundations of the organization and what are they making easy or difficult for the organization to do? If we look at ownership and financing, if the owners of the organization or the people who find don't share regenerative values or the frameworks upon which those agreements were made tie the organization into certain things like quarterly returns or uh, reaching a certain value by a certain point, again, that might limit the organization's opportunities to really think more expansively, more long term, more systemic. And the final thing I'll reference on this slide is around the organization's relationship with the natural world. Some organizations that you visit, and tends to be kind of more global international organizations, tend to feel a bit disconnected from place. They're so widespread and so global that they don't have, um, they're not that consciously um, in touch with the ways in which they are interacting with the natural world, how they are impacted by it, or how they are impacting upon it. Whereas some organizations that are really in touch with those interactions, it may be much easier for them to be able to recognize where the choices and decisions they're making could be leading to negative impacts on that natural environment. So we can pull out a few overarching characteristics of what might characterize a more regenerative approach to some of these foundation elements of an organization. Things like acknowledging historic harms and working to remedy those. Things like contributing to a bigger picture than the organization itself. The fact that its fundamental legal and financing and, uh, arrangements are built on shared values. And an organization that is more aware of its relationship and its interdependence with the natural world. Let's turn to the second area, 
So this is where we talk about the organization's roots. If we think about a tree, a tree's root system wants to be diverse. Those roots want to be many, they want to be deep, uh, and they want to be a kind of good free flowing re uh, relationship or movement of information or materials up and down. So if we think about the root network of an organization, the network, the people, that's your employees, your suppliers, your communities, your customers, your partners. And so if we think about well, how could that be related to the greater thriving of life? Well, in a number of ways. Firstly, there's a direct relationship. So if the uh, relationships that an organization has with its network are hostile, are really unbalanced in terms of power, are really closed in don't, not sharing information, not trusting of one another, not open or honest, then that's quite a, an ungenerative place for the people in that relationship to be anyway. That's not a that's sort of fun relationship to inhabit. And equally, that has a knock on effect, because if there is that kind of relationship, then it's unlikely that the organization is really gathering accurate information about the impacts that it's having in the world. If we, for example, imagine that an organization's relationship with its suppliers are based on lots of very short term arrangements, very short term contracts, there's no real commitment to each other. Um, there's a lot of, you know, here are, it's a very imbalanced power relationship. Here are our expectations of you and you need to jump through these hoops by this point. It's unlikely in that situation that the supplier is going to be completely honest and transparent with the organization about challenges that it's facing. Oh, we know that there's a process further down our own supply chain that's really carbon intensive and it's producing loads of greenhouse gases and we're not sure what to do about it. Oh, we have a feeling that there's some real health and safety issues uh, in this area of our organization. It's unlikely the organization is really going to be hearing about that from its supplier. And it's also then not going to be as capable of responding to those, of coming up with solutions, of managing those issues. Similarly, if we think about employees, if you have an employee on a zero hours contract with no commitment to you, it's unlikely that the organization is really going to be able to be learning about the impact it's having on its employees and what that's doing in the world. So there are, oh, and the final thing I'll say about this is about diversity. And time and again, ecosystems demonstrate to us that the more diverse a system is, the more adaptable and resilient it is. And the same lessons as I just touched on apply. If you are an organization and you only are tapping into a very undiverse mix of points of view, of backgrounds, of profiles, then you are likely not learning about the ways in which you're impacting other spaces in society. So what are the characteristics that we can draw out of what make a more regenerative organization's root system? What characterizes a more regenerative network? Well, it's one with lots of connections where an organization is tapping into all sorts of different sources of information, where that network is a, comes from a really diverse set of backgrounds and profiles and ways of thinking, and where the relationships in that network are really deep and reciprocal and trusting and open. Third area we're going to turn to is the trunk. So this is a really chunky area. This is involves loads and loads and loads of different things about the internal environment, but it's things like the actual physical environment of the of where the work gets done. What's the nature of that? But also, what's the kind of culture? The level of psychological safety. How are decisions made? What are the incentive structures? How are the processes working? And on and on. Um, again, I'll give a few examples of how this might relate to this idea of the greater thriving of life. So again, we can see some really direct impacts. If you're working in a space that's unsafe, maybe physically, it's noisy, it's hot, um, the fire escapes are blocked, that's not uh, a, a way, um, that's an environment in which the people who work in that can really thrive. But equally, again, there are indirect impacts. If you have an environment in your organization that's really psychologically unsafe, i.e. there is a culture of fear, of blame, where people are not encouraged to ask questions or take risks or be creative, then you as an organization are not benefiting from the creativity and productivity of those people. There was a study done by Google not long ago, which was looking into what are the key characteristics that differentiate the most productive teams. And the overwhelming answer to that question was psychological safety. So if you as an organization have a regenerative vision of trying to contribute to systemic support, and yet there isn't a culture of psychological safety in your organization, then the possibility of you having that regenerative impact is really limited. 
Final example is about processes and incentive structures. I have worked with plenty of organizations in the past when we've looked at like their procurement strategies, how they decide who they're going to work with, what they're going to buy, from whom, on what terms. And there isn't really a well thought through strategy about communicating what their expectations are around environmental and social standards, working with suppliers to improve them. The incentive structures are completely disconnected from that. All of the procurement professionals are incentivized by cost reductions, and there's nothing in there about environmental or social um, impacts of the decisions they make. Then clearly that's not as supportive of regenerative outcomes as it could be. So again, we have lots of characteristics here that might differentiate a more regenerative approach from a less regenerative approach. Fourth area, we've got five, remember, so four out of five. Fruits, flowers, and foliage, what the organization puts out into the world, products, packaging, waste, emissions, messaging, taxes, reporting. Again, a big chunky area. How is this related to the greater thriving of life? Well, clearly, if the packaging an organization produces is toxic, it's non-biodegradable, it accumulates in our ecosystem, that's about thriving. But equally, if we think about the messaging that an organization puts out, if that's toxic, if that's discriminatory, if that's manipulative, then that's also not supportive of our thriving. And finally, if we think about um, Porting, an area that people kind of often think, oh, how does that fit in here? Again, if you're an organization with a wish for a regen, you have a regenerative vision, you're wishing for systemic, holistic change in the world, and you're not sharing what you're learning about what's working for you, where you're facing real challenges and getting stuck. If you're not sharing that with the wider community openly and transparently, then you're slowing down progress in the system as a whole, which could be speeded up if you were more open. So again, key characteristics of a more regenerative approach to what you put out in the world is organizations that are more generous, that are more honest, that put things out that are not toxic, not wasteful, or that are inspired by nature. And final area now, materials. What flows through the organization? So that includes the raw materials. So the raw materials that go into the products that the organization makes or that go into the offices. What makes the machinery that you use? What are the chemicals that are involved in the various different stages of your operations? Cleaning your offices, processing some of your supply chain activities. But also what about the energy that flows through the organization? Where does that come from? How is it used? All the money often not talked about, where does that come from? How is it used? How might these things relate to whether or not an organization is more or less regenerative? Well, clearly, if an organization's energy that it's using to power its factories, to transport its goods, to run its offices, is based on fossil fuels and producing greenhouse gas emissions and contributing to climate change, that's not supportive of the greater thriving of life. Equally, if the materials that are going through this organization are extracted or processed in ways that are very damaging socially or environmentally, that's not supportive. But if we turn to money here, if we think about how that flows, does that flow smoothly? Does it move smoothly from where it's made to where it's needed to support the overall vision? Or does it accumulate in certain parts? Is it distributed unfairly? That's also not supportive of the greater thriving of life. So if we think about more regenerative approaches to materials, you don't have too much and you don't have too little. What you have is fairly and evenly distributed. It flows smoothly to where it's needed, comes from renewable sources, is used efficiently, low energy to make, low waste, comes from local sources, is non-toxic, and on and on. I'm hoping that this next slide will help to bring some of these five elements together. I'm going to talk through Example. So last year, Tilco worked with a small business, a bakery. Um, they are um, they have a retail business, a wholesale business, a cafe, um, and we work with them to run what we call a regeneration assessment, which is where we look at the organisation from all of these different angles. We speak to staff, we speak to suppliers, we speak to customers, we visit the supply chain, we spend a lot of time in the organization's own sites and we really inquire into these different areas to figure out well, where are their stories of thriving already where is their regenerative practice to learn from and where are their real areas of opportunity to strengthen the regenerative practice. so i just want to share a few of the insights that we gathered from that process 
So when we came to the soil, for example, there was a really wonderful regenerative story um, around the origin of the organization and its vision. Really, this organization came about from a desire to create a food system that really was nourishing for people and for planet. So it was an amazing basis for the organization to make decisions and to guide itself in its direction towards regenerative actions. Equally, in terms of relationship with nature, which is part of this soil piece, that connection to the natural world, because they're a bakery and they work with a living organism in the form of yeast, they're really connected to the fact that they're all the time working with nature. They're affected by temperature and by season and having to navigate that in a very practical way. And they're also really connected to where their goods are coming from, trying to grow as much grain as possible from a heritage grain grown a few miles away, uh, and so on. So they're really connected to that. That was an area of organization. When it comes to the roots, their network, again, there was some amazing stuff to talk about because they had a really fantastic web of reciprocal relationships. Customers who became suppliers, housemates who became colleagues, partners who became customers, this incredibly long-term relationships that built and built and flourished and adapted. But there was an issue in terms of there was a real lack of diversity in the people who were in that network. So that was really identified in air as an area that they really needed to focus on in future. With regards to the trunk, the internal pieces, um, there were lots of important areas of thriving here. The physical environment of the bakehouse and where people operated is beautiful. There's a lot of natural environments, lots of natural light, lots of openness. Um, in terms of the ways in which they work and communicate, there's a lot of autonomy, a lot of freedom, people talking about this being the best job they've ever had. But equally, real opportunities there too because some of the leadership structures the decision making structures were not really very clear in an attempt to move away from kind of rigid hierarchies they had been left with a with kind of a lack of clarity for people that feel unsure that sometimes it led to delays or unfair outcomes that was an area that we really focused on in terms of improvements fruits flowers and foliage what they put out in the world well the bread that they produce is amazing and incredibly nourishing. The packaging that they produce is all biodegradable and minimized as much as possible. They have taken some really fantastic steps to limit waste. Um, any waste produced is either composted or offered into the community, into the food bank or the too good to go schemes, things like that. Um, they really work to limit emissions. They use sailboats to transport oil and things like that from around the olive oil and things like that from around the world uh, and electric vehicles and so on. Um, but there were still some things to work on there in terms of messaging so that they could share some more about the lessons that they're learning. And finally, materials. Again, they've taken loads of effort to try and source materials locally. Um, but nonetheless, there were always challenges. That, so the coffee that they sell, it has to come from a long way away. And there are certain social and economic and, and environmental issues associated with some of the supply chain for some of the goods that they purchase. So there are still challenges around that. So I hope that gives a little bit of an overview of what one organization is doing and what these kind of different areas look like. It's clearly not the only example of an organization that's kind of grappling with this idea of trying to be more regenerative. There are loads of organizations out there doing amazing things and working towards this. Um, I saw uh, Ramona come on the call, I think, flash up, who's just joined the other Dada, oh. which is an amazing, <laughs> an amazing architecture firm, which is really seeking to put regenerative practices and nature inspired design at the middle of what they do. Um, Biome is this fantastic bio manufacturing company, which is trying to generate materials for the construction industry made from waste. And they have a vision to create a healthier and more sustainable built environment. Um, seventh generation, I have to mention them, they have a commitment that every single decision that they make will consider the impact of that decision on the next seven generations. And on and on and on. Um, I could talk through, talk a lot about all of these and there are many others. But I think it is important to point out that I don't think any one of these organizations or any other can really say that they are regenerative in its entirety because uh, they're all working at different things. And this is in fact, I think in a way the, the name of this, um, this session is a bit misleading because I don't think it's really possible to say for certain we are a regenerative organization. I think it's about, there are organizations that are further 
down that road and those that are further behind. It's, an, it's a journey of continuous improvement, of continuously moving towards the greater and greater thriving of life. It's not a, a destination that you reach and say, we're done, we can call a objective now. I think it's a process. And I also wanna say, just before we close, that this is not easy, um, especially when we're in systems that are degenerative themselves and we have macroeconomic systems, political systems, tax, legal systems that are not always very supportive of regenerative objectives. Um, it's absolutely a big thing. As we talked about earlier, being regenerative is holistic, it's ambitious, it's transformatory. So I think although it's not easy, I think it absolutely is necessary. I think if we want to leave a legacy worth inheriting, we all need to be thinking about how we can be more regenerative. And I hope this presentation has gone some distance to help demystify what that concept is and what that might mean in the context of organizations and organizational practice. Um, the next phase that we have in this conversation is a conversation is to open up the floor to, to broader conversation. I'd so love to hear what, uh, what you're all holding and what kind of ideas and questions you have. I do have a few kind of initial questions um, to put up in case that might start kickstart the conversation, some questions that I have. I'd be curious to know what it's like to sort of start to think about organizations as organisms. Um, definitely want to know if there's anything that feels unclear. I've whistled through a lot, so I'm sure there are things. Um, I'd love to know if there's something that you're working on that you'd like help with, and, and maybe you have some feelings about where help is really needed at the moment uh, for organizations more broadly. And I also just want to say a massive thank you to we all for the opportunity to talk about this, for you all for being here. Uh, I'll put some of our information about kind of Tilco and uh, how you can stay in touch with us in the chat a bit later, but I just so look forward to continuing this conversation with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was, that was really clear, really useful. And the way that you have presented it, it gives us a path and a lot of questions that can be applicable in so many areas so thank you yeah i'm positive i have heard already i mean i have read already many different comments in the chat um and and everybody is is feeling that the same way that thank you for for that clarity in those examples because it's very helpful um my colleague Tobile, she's doing, she's putting the questions on the chat but before we my start working on those questions Anyone has any questions, anything that who would like to, anything you would like to bring to the group or ask directly to Hannah, this is the, uh, this is the moment to do it. Otherwise we can jump into the conversation with those questions, interesting questions that she's bringing in here. Gillian? Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks Hannah so much for a lovely presentation. Um, really enjoyed that. I've got a question around the money. Um, and I'm sure in your work, you've come across loads of different kind of regenerative ways of money flowing through an organization. I'm interested in hearing a few of those because I mean, traditionally, especially in kind of small owner led organizations, money kind of flows, flows up. If there is excess profit, it flows up to the kind of the owners of the organization maybe sometimes some of it gets redistributed in terms of if there is a kind of uh, a profit pool that some of that goes back to staff but what is what are some of the exciting kind of innovations in this space that you're seeing mm, amazing question jill thank you um yeah i think the money piece is big and, and so often it's not talked about enough um because it's it's vital it's a vital nutrient for any organization to to run and to, and to thrive um so in terms of how other organizations are grappling with this, I think there's a, a whole real range. Some have a real, I think transparency is often a massive part about being clear about where, where profit is going, where you're intending for it to go. Elvis and Cressy, which is one of the organizations that I flagged up on the, on the screen, I know that they have a commitment to give 50% of their profits always to a particular charity related to their, their mission. So they have kind of been quite clear about that. And I think internally they have arrangements, you know, they have commitments around being a living wage employer as a kind of minimum baseline, but they also have, um, I think, real transparency around where their money goes. I think that transparency is key. 
And I think it's also related to the kind of pieces about the trunk, about decision making, about power and about leadership. Because I think where those things are more dispersed and more dynamic, so uh, if just to bring in Favi, which was another organization that I flagged up, they're a French manufacturer, and they have um, a kind of really quite radical self-managing process. They, um, they organize themselves into different teams, and within those teams, they can make lots of different decisions autonomously. But other organizations use things like advice processes to say, well, we want to spend this amount of money on this, but they need to get advice from X, Y, Z people in the organization before they can make that call. Um, so I think what I'm getting at there is that organizations can make choices about how open they are and who gets to decide where the money goes. So in organizations where you say, OK, the decision making sits with us all or the decision making is goes through this kind of process, um, then I think that's how it's best applied to money is where you make decisions about salaries and where money goes in using those kind of more dispersed and fluid leadership and decision making structures. Thank you, Hannah. Um, thank you so much. Susanna, um, I noticed you left a question on the chat. I don't know if you have the capacity to unmute yourself and ask and share this um, personally, or you want me to read it from the chat. It's probably best if you can do it personally, if you want to. Oh, you cannot. Okay. So um, Hannah, I read it for you. Don't worry about it. No, 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 I don't mind at all. I just want to give everybody the opportunity to talk if they, if they want to. So um, she was wondering how we get businesses to choose to be regenerative. It seems to me until they see that the value of regenerative business creates is much greater long-term than short-term gain. Is measuring social impact and social value more consistently the best way to get there to make them see it? That's her question. Yeah, amazing question. And, and clearly, um, as I say, this is hard work. So um, if an organization doesn't want to do it, then it's unlikely that it's going to be able to make really sort of significant and meaningful strides toward this ambition if, if that's not where they're kind of starting from. So I think in terms of how you get businesses to choose to be regenerative, and I think you mentioned businesses in particular, but I think probably organizations more broadly, um, I think it really is quite dependent on. It, the, the role of the owners and the, and the finances and the, the power holders in the organizational structure at the moment, whether or not they want to be part of this new story is key. Um, it's absolutely key. And what convinces one person, one CEO or one owner um, to kind of get involved in this varies from the other. Um, I think that generally speaking, talking about the scale of the, of the problem, the scale of the challenge that we face is, I think, always a crucial, a crucial place to start um, to really acknowledge the challenge that we face, because I think any organization that really wants to a be around in 50 years or, you know, never mind really be thriving and contributing and and providing opportunities in the ways that presumably it wants to. If it really wants that, then I think there has to be an acknowledgement that we have to have a, a, an L, a world kind of that we can live on in order for that to happen. We have to have systems that function in order for that organization to, to be able to thrive and to exist. So I think bringing them to the information about, um, about the scale of the challenge is a piece. But other leaders, other um, key people have found, you know, interacting with nature and increasing their connection to nature and and the kind of broader natural system is also a really powerful shift for them in terms of what what makes uh, the move into being more open to this idea of regenerative but i also think there's a piece about understanding what it means so things like hopefully today giving a bit more granularity around this term which can feel quite quite lofty quite vague it's important to kind of bring that into something that feels more tangible offer people ways to step into it because we can't equally wait for every single organization to to move into a place of really caring about this we need to support organizations to move into it and see it as part of how they work anyway and there are lots and lots of different examples for each of the different areas that we've spoken about that link greater regenerative practice to greater performance along kind of more traditional metrics 
So if we take, as I mentioned, psychological safety, that was a clear relationship between that and overall productivity. There's increasingly data which demonstrates that organizations that perform well on ESG criteria perform better economically as well, that they can retain their staff more. Um, there are so many different sources of, of data out there which link these kinds of practices to those more traditional metrics of success for organizations, which which might be something to turn to. Um, and you're talking about is measuring social impact and social value more consistently the best way to get there? Um, I think, I feel like I'd want you to expand a little bit on that perhaps, but um, I, don't, I don't know that it, that it necessarily is required um, that we are kind of thinking about social value consistently. I think what I would probably more point to is that it's important that we think systemically. It's important that we try and think about I think the challenges that we face in the world are systemic, are complex, are interconnected. And so our ability to respond to them well, we need tools and approaches that are as complex and nuanced and interconnected and dynamic as the challenges that we face. So I think with when we're thinking about what we put out there or what tools and approaches we use to address this, I think we need to be thinking about having tools that are appropriate for the complexity and the dynamism of the challenges that we're trying to address. Thank you so much, Hannah. It was a complex question, but uh, thank you so much for your, your, all your input. Um, there is a question on the chat by Ramona. It's, it's actually very practical in terms of if there are, if you have some resources to dive deeper, especially on organizational processes and structures. Um, she's asking, yeah, resources. I'm, I'm not sure if you need more information. Ramona, maybe you want to expand a little bit on that. Great, Ramona, if you um, can. Yes. Sure, Hannah. Hi, first of all. Nice to uh, <laughs> meet you. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, uh, since everyone already knows uh, that I'm from the other data, like, we're currently uh, looking a lot into um, the organizational structures and processes that we're having to really um, build a system that whatever new projects we take on, whatever questions come up on regenerative practices, we actually, you know, make good decisions on, on that and have good mechanisms in place to um, to continue on that path. Because as an organization grows, the more areas there are, the more complex decisions you have to make. And I know that like in, uh, let's say, Frédéric Lalou, um, Reinventing Organizations, where she's talking about different examples also from Burzog and, and other companies. Um, he's giving some practical insights on the advice process and other things that you've already mentioned. But are you aware of any other toolboxes that you can turn to? Because as this field is so new, for, for me, it's often easy to like grasp the concept. But then the moment you're sitting there and being like, OK, now how do I actually make this happen? I think that's where a lot of people struggle at the moment. Mm. Yeah, beautiful question. I think you're so right uh, about that. Um, well, um, if I hear you, you're kind of particularly grappling with kind of processes around decision making and, and how you're going to kind of stay true to your, your values as you navigate different choices as an organization. OK, I see some nodding. So I'm actually working with an organization now on exactly this. They're trying to figure out what kind of structure, what kinds of processes might actually support them to make decisions as a, as a kind of very rapidly growing and, and expanding team um, and keep this central. And I think the main toolbox that I would refer to, um, although I would say that it's, it is important that, that you kind of adapt this uh, for your own organization, but I do think the holacracy framework and the tools associated with holacracy are extremely supportive. Um, the kinds of structures that they offer in terms of the options for how you might organize yourself into teams, how you might communicate, how you might decide to make decisions. Um, the idea of kind of some constitution or some set of rules or structures to support that process is, is a really important one. But I think how you choose to implement that in your own organization will need to be adapted to, to you. Um, so for example, it might be about having a really core set of values that you check in with around every decision. Um, so like seventh generation, having something really straightforward that says, okay, we have a process whereby we inquire into what seven generations from now might think of this decision that we're making and how are we going to do that? Maybe we need an external council to represent different points of view or something. 
But I think holacracy in general is a great toolbox, but I think you can adapt some of the principles in there to what you specifically need. I hope that's helpful. Wonderful, and I'm gonna leave um, I'm, I'm gonna leave a link as well of the business of well-being guide, um, just in case it could be useful for Ramona for everyone here in in the room. Um, so now I see Isabel raising her hand. I just want to say I am so happy to see her in this room. Um, Isabel was um, part of the amplification team, and she was actually the person who connected me with Hannah the very first time. So Isabel, the mic is yours. Good to see you. It's very loud where I am, so I'm sorry. There's dance classes going on. I'm out of uh, meeting a friend. Anyway, it's so very lovely to be here, Hannah. Um, I'm glad to see this come to fruition. Um, I have a very quick question. So I'm working now at an organization that is not on this train at all. And um, I think I've been trying to have a conversation. For example, we have 21 days of vacation here at our company, but four of those days are mandatory. You have to take during when we're shut down for two weeks. So I was sort of like, why don't you just have like we really actually only have 17 days of vacation, right? If And then we're just shut down for two weeks. Why do we say we have 21? And my boss's response was like, well, we're not profitable yet. So like, we're not going to do that because we're not profitable yet. So why would we give people more days off? And I wanted so badly to have like under my belt, like all of these um, just like examples of like, no, that doesn't, that doesn't correlate. Like productivity doesn't correlate with days that you're working or whatever, whatever. But curious, like, how do you start the process? How do you get people to start to think and to change their thinking? And with my boss, he's very data oriented. So I'm like, should I do research to try to figure out how to prove my point? And then I can bring it up at a different point in time. Um, but yeah, curious, any thoughts on, on that? And I'll turn my mic off because it's very loud. Thank you. Mm, yeah, thank you so much for bringing a really live, practical, specific piece, Isabel, um, and so good to see you. Um, so I think it's interesting what you said that, you know, the organisation you said is, is really not on this track. Uh, and so it makes me feel like it's likely that the, the kind of the soil pieces, the, the origin story, the mission, the vision, the, the kind of basic structures of the organisation probably are not currently aligned. Uh, or optimized with regenerative values. Uh, I see you nodding. Um, so I think probably given that, there certainly is data. There absolutely is data, which as you say, correlates. There are loads of organizations that are trialing four day weeks, four and a half day weeks, um, different kinds of arrangements and are finding that it's really supporting the productivity and the well-being of their staff. Um, so I think data is definitely something that I think could help you with this one stick piece. Um, but I think there's probably a broader conversation. And I actually, I, I reached out to my network ahead of this conversation to sort of see, well, what, what questions were people holding more broadly um, to kind of try and weave into my conversation? And there was a real question that came up a few times about, well, what's the most important action to take? If there's one thing to do, what might that be? And I think it's probably about having a conversation about the vision and mission of the organization trying to talk together about why you exist, what you're there to do. And I think going through a process of exploring that, um, and there is, I think Favi is the example I'm thinking of here that went through a process and new CEO joined and they did a kind of a whole organizational process of engaging with all of this, all of the team to go, well, why, why do we exist? Um, and figuring out like, okay, well, how does that link to, to is, do we really just exist for kind of a, a quite internal introspective purpose or do we have a bigger purpose? Because if you feel that there is a bigger purpose to your organization, and I'm willing to bet that there is, that there is a purpose for this organization that goes beyond its borders, um, then really that sh changes the nature of the questions that you're asking about things like working week. Because then if you're orientated around an objective that says, we want a systemic shift in this, we want to see um, whatever it is, then it changes the orientation for all of that decision making. And maybe you can then say, okay, well, if that's our goal, then is working or it having few holiday, having fewer days holiday, is that supportive of that goal or not? Or is there evidence that, should, that suggests that actually by having a bit more holiday, a bit more autonomy, maybe our staff will be a bit more well, a bit more productive, that might be more supportive of our overall goal. 
Um, so I'd say probably linking it back to your, your vision and mission and encouraging a conversation around that. Thank you so and much. Please, anyone else who has ideas on this, I'm really aware I'm, I'm certainly not the only kind of person with ideas on, on these, these questions coming in. If anyone else has any thoughts on some of the questions that have come through, please, please put them forward. Yes, I was actually, because I, I don't see any hands raising right now. I don't know if anyone has any other questions, but, um, or it wants to share anything in particular or a thought or an idea or an example. Yes, Naomi, please go ahead. Hi. Sorry, I've been gambling with the baby, so I'm running around the house. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, Bring the baby with you. <laughs> well, she's with dad for now, but so um, I was just wondering, hi, Hannah, and thanks for the, the presentation. Um, I love the analogy of the tree, and I think it's really, yeah, speaks to a lot of these things that, that kind of make sense. Um, I was just wondering in terms of the, the kind of businesses you work with, do, do you screen them in any way? Because, you know, the, the sense that, uh, you know, do you do a kind of due diligence, like I'm not going to work with you because I, I just see that, for example, your, your purpose or your culture is just not in a place that is going to be able to create regenerative value? Or do you kind of accept anyone who, who, who wants to go on that journey? Oh, thank you so much <laughs> for asking this question. Um, yes. I have one, we have one criteria. The criteria is, are you really ready for really difficult conversations? Are you really ready to be asked difficult questions? Are you really ready to look at the fundamentals of the organization and to be open to a really ambitious, holistic, transformative agenda? If that is the case, then let's get started. What Tealco is not in the business of doing is, yeah, of kind of trying to think around the edges of an organization that isn't actually up for that more fundamental shift. Um, it's absolutely fine if you are millions of miles away from that. If there is a willingness and a readiness to engage in that journey wholeheartedly and authentically, then we're with you. And, and maybe a follow up to that question, because <laughs> there's something I'm, I'm kind of gambling with a little bit but have you ever found yourself in a situation where within the course of that relationship because I, I imagine sometimes it's almost a bit like uh, a coaching you know an elongated coaching relationship where you think you know you're just not getting it and this is not working ha has this has this happened to you it hasn't happened yet but I it certainly has in previous careers in previous um jobs definitely where you know a level of ambition was there at the proposal stage and then that deteriorates as we move through the project um so that i think it's a really wise question to ask and i think we i think the way in which i would anticipate we would approach that is if we sensed like the we'd reached that that, that level of willingness and ambition was no longer there then i think we would then have to a, be honest about that, reflect that back and say, look, this is what we're seeing, have a conversation to say, well, is that true or has something else, is something else going on that we're just not understanding? Because like I say, this is hard work. It's not, you know, I have empathy for the difficulty of this. I have empathy for organizations going, oh my goodness, we thought we could do this, but we can't. We have this and this to worry about. This is not possible. That's all totally welcome. And it's important that we hear that. And um, so finding it hard is, is absolutely not a problem. But if the real willingness to engage in the difficult stuff goes, then I think we would have to renegotiate what we're doing together. Um, because I think the integrity of the work is the thing that matters most to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. Okay, so we are five minutes um, closer to the end. It's only five minutes left. Um, I want us to have, you know, I want you to have the opportunity. If there is something, the last question that you would like to ask to Hannah in terms of something that is not completely clear, or something that is at the tip of your tongue and you want to say before um, closing up the, this you and we'll talk, this is the time, this is the moment. Hannah, just, yeah. just a, a quick question in terms of who are like the main networks who are hosting events like this and really kind of propagating regenerative organizational practice that we should be following? 
Great question. Well, I do think the Wellbeing Economy Alliance is the place. Um, it is an amazing hub for all of these ideas and actions. Um, uh, I was part of a, uh, uh, an initiative, several of the people are here, the Bioleadership Fellowship, um, where I connected to lots and lots of different organizations who are working. Um, the other Dada is one of the, is part of that, um, who was one of the organizations mentioned earlier where Ramona works. Um, so I think the Bioleadership Fellowship and the Bioleadership Project connected to that is, is a kind of, kind of hub um, there's uh, an organization called Positive, um, which has done quite a bit of work to bring together, I've forgotten the names of how you can get involved, but you can be involved in different types of different um, relationship with the organization as kind of uh, a hub of people who are working in the space, or if you want to come in and ask for work to be done. Um, the RSA has quite a lot, they have a new strand uh, in the UK, um, the Royal Society for Arts, they have a new strand on lots of thinking around regeneration, and I think they call it the New Futures Initiative, but there's, um, maybe it's not called that, but there is a, there is a part of the, the RSA's kind of thinking and thought leadership that's, that's around regeneration. The House of Beautiful Business is actually another kind of um, network where there's quite a lot of thinking around regeneration, they're stepping into a bit more of that. Um, and then there are just some fantastic people to absolutely follow. Daniel Christian Vall, who is like the, the father of a lot of regenerative thinking, definitely um, he's worth looking at. Um, Giles Hutchins and Laura Storm did fantastic work on regenerative leadership and continue to do that. Um, Michelle Holliday's Thriveability work is something that brings a lot of inspiration to, to us at Tealco. Otto Sharma's Theory U. Permaculture is a massive source of inspiration for me and us at Tealco. Uh, biomimicry, which I think is the term that, that stumped you, Anna, at the beginning. Um, biomimicry is a massive source of inspiration. Um, yeah, lots else. Uh, if, you, if you tap into the, the Tealco website, which I popped into the chat a minute ago, there is a section on kind of our inspiration and you can find a few of the, the connections there. Um, but there's that's only a beginning. There's, there's a lot, uh, I'm very happy to say, a lot of activity happening in this space now. I'd like, Gillian, to, um, um, to let you know that on the chat there are a few other, um, from, I hope you saw it. Okay, wonderful. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so Priyanka, I think you're going to be the last one for this talk. Um, you have your hand in there, so please unmute yourself. Uh, hello, Hannah. Uh, this Hello. is Priyanka. So uh, I have a question. Uh, like uh, for uh, companies in emerging countries, like they are already facing issues um, regarding net zero transformation. So in that particular case, if they want to become uh, regenerative also, so what kind of capabilities or more strictly dynamic capabilities do they, do they need for this? Hmm. Oh, okay, beautiful. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Um, I think, first of all, I feel I feel like it's important to point to one of the pieces in the soil element, which is about kind of the origin story of organizations. Lots of big uh, global North organizations have left really terrible legacies uh, around the world, often felt most keenly in the global South. And um, part of being regenerative for those organizations is about acknowledging that impact and, and really taking responsibility for re remediating, or remediating, sorry, that, that impact. That's not speaking to your question, Priyanka, but just your point about developing countries just made me feel like that was an important point to revisit. So to your piece about what capabilities does an organization need to head down this road of, of regenerative, it's not vital that an organization has kind of specialisms in any one of any kind of one particular area. The most important thing is, is the willingness, is the kind of, is that that wish to be part of a of a bigger, of a bigger picture, that wish to be a, a net contributor, to be giving something back to the systems in which you're in. That's the most crucial ingredient. All of the other pieces you can find. Um, inspiration or guidance from other organizations that are already playing in this space. Um, there are people like myself and, and others working in the space who will be desperate to offer you know, more guidance and support around particular parts of, uh, of that journey. But I think the only crucial ingredient is that, is that willingness and that openness to really embarking on the journey and the, and the challenges that it might, it might bring up. 
Uh, you don't need to be specialists in sustainability or environmental protection or human rights in order to head down this road. Um, some of those things might be helpful at different junctions, but you don't need anything. Okay, thank you so much. But still, I have one question. If I don't have uh, resources, for example, uh, if I don't have financial resources or some uh, other thing, and I am uh, like uh, facing, I am troubling to achieve net zero. Then, like going beyond net zero, or being like uh, uh, considering uh, positive impact is too difficult for me. So, like, what is your uh, uh, perspective on this? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think it's it's a bit difficult to respond to that without knowing a bit more about your organisation and, and the nuances of it. Um, but certainly, you know, as I say, this is this is tough and it requires requires input and resource. But generally speaking, being regenerative is actually about finding ways that um, that kind of support themselves. So, being um, you know net zero or being nature positive uh, is often actually it can be sort of a relatively straightforward process. It might involve cutting quite, quite important things or shifting the way you do things quite significantly, but actually kind of minimizing our impact is, is how nature operates. You know, that's how the, the broader world operates generally anyway. So there are often some relatively straightforward ways to think about how we might do this, but it might involve changing some quite fundamental things about the organization itself and how it's currently set up. So I think it would be, it's difficult for me to speak to that without being able to get into some of that in, those intricacies with you, Priyanka, but I would be really happy to pick that up with you afterwards and to learn a bit more about your organization specifically and, and how it works um, and to maybe kind of get into a bit more detail about how you might be able to manage that challenge of your ambition with the resources that you have. Thank you so much, Hannah. And I'm sorry, but we're running. We went over the hour. Um, I don't think we're going to, we cannot get many of the questions or more comments, but I hope that this whole hour that we have spent together and having Hannah, um, you know, and sharing so much uh, with all of us has been meaningful and useful. And obviously she left all the information on the chat for you to continue um, connecting with her and being in touch with her. If you wanna continue this conversation or exploring possibilities of um, collaboration with her, I hope that, uh, that you take that opportunity because she offered and, and and um, yeah, I, I think it, you can do many wonderful things together. So this is the end of the Yoon Wheel Talk. I hope that you have all enjoyed it. I hope that it was um, meaningful and, and inspiring. I just want to say thank you for being here, for participating. Thank you so much, Hannah, for your time and for everything that you have given us today. Uh, we're taking it with all of us. And uh, I hope to see